Hi there, welcome to Alpine Bravo. My name's Brendan and this is my channel for all things Microsoft Flight Simulator. In this video we'll be carrying on with our series of tutorials on how to fly the Dare Kodiak 100 by Simwork Studios. One of the finest uh, G aircraft currently available in the simulator. Also one of the trickiest to fly. And in this video we'll be looking at the most important part of the whole process, which will be flying a approach and then conducting normal landings. And we'll be considering performance, checklists and flows, landing technique, uh, bolt landing and some of the common problems people encounter when trying to land the Kodiak. As with all the other videos in this tutorial series, this is not for real world use and it's for simulation purposes only. And also it's worth saying that uh, these videos are designed to be watched in uh, sequence so if you've skipped some of the earlier ones you may want to revisit those if you find I'm talking about things that you're not already aware of and also I'm assuming that you have got a basic level of knowledge in how to fly an aircraft this is not a basic flight instruction so the first thing we'll do is hop into the classroom and consider some of the landing performance for the Kodiak. So when we come to think about landing performance uh, for the Kodiak, there's a couple of uh, elements to it. There's the uh, maximum landing weight, the landing distances and the landing speed. Um, the maximum landing weight for the Kodiak is very straightforward in all conditions, all variants, whether you've got Thunder tires, cargo pod, whatever the altitude, it's 6690 pounds. And that's pretty close to the maximum takeoff weight. Uh, you'd only have to be flying for a few minutes and you'd burn off at maximum takeoff weight and you'd burn off enough fuel to achieve your maximum landing weight. So it is not normally a factor in normal operations. The next consideration is landing distance that you require. And unfortunately, there's no table in the Kodiak manual. Uh, there is in the pilot operating handbook. It's uh, obviously crucial to work this out when you are conducting short field operations uh, with bush flying. Um, but given that the Kodiak is a short takeoff and landing capable aircraft, if you were coming into land at your typical uh, airport with maybe two or three uh, three thousand feet of asphalt uh, available on a normal paved runway you're normally going to have uh, plenty of runway uh, because we can see from this uh, the absolute maximum landing distance is uh, 2475 feet and that would be at max landing weight 10,000 feet above sea level and or pressure altitude of uh, 10,000 feet above sea level and 20 degrees so that would be very hot and high so a 3000 foot normal uh, runway is going to be uh, plenty to get down and landed a more typical if you're coming in at sea level around 6000 pounds and standard sort of temperature around about 10 degrees C uh, you're looking at 1387 feet and that's to clear a 50 foot obstacle the ground rule will be quite a lot shorter than that um, there are a number of factors uh, that you can see listed below uh, that will adjust the value uh, the first factor applies to that total distance um, uh, which is when you have a headwind uh, or a tailwind and then uh, the other factors relate to the ground roll, uh, so it will take longer to stop on grass surfaces as opposed to tarmac, so you've got less effective braking action. Um, and then you've got, uh, obviously, it's going to take longer to stop on a downslope, shorter on an upslope. And uh, if you use the reverse thrust, uh, you can bring the stopping distance down by about 15% approximately. We then need to consider maximum winds, uh, max demonstrated crosswind 60 knots. Um, if you've got a pure 60 knot crosswind, uh, the Kodiak is definitely quite tricky to, to, tricky to land in those conditions. You really mean to bring your A game for that, particularly if there are gusts. And the maximum tailwind of 10 knots, but again, not very advisable to land in a 10 knot tailwind. Probably wouldn't want to go much higher than five. 
And finally, we need to consider landing speeds. Uh, now, again, there isn't a table uh, as such in the Kodiak manual or indeed in the pilot operating handbook. Um, but uh, for normal landing, the approach speed is between 80 and 85 knots. But then the operating handbook goes on to say that for landing, you want to land just at above stall speed. Uh, so I thought it'd be useful just to show what the stall speeds are uh, in various typical configurations. Now, obviously, the stall speed will depend on the bank angle, but for landing, you're going to want to be wings level. And this is also at sea level. So with flaps 35, uh, you're going to be stalling at 47 knots uh, indicated. All these speeds here are indicated. Uh, typically, you would want to land at um, 1.3 times the stall speed VSO, and that would give you 61 knots at flaps 35, or if you were coming in up for flaps 20, 64. And it is worth saying that you can land the Kodiak uh, in any flap configuration between maximum at 35, 20 degrees, 10 degrees, or no flaps. Uh, and as you can see, that comes all the way down to 56 knots uh, for flaps 35 if you were just 5,000 uh, pounds heavy. Uh, and that's getting quite close to the landing speed of a Cessna C172. However, you may wish to uh, not let your speed get that low. It will depend on the configuration and how you find the aircraft handles. But uh, getting to those sort of speeds below 60 knots, uh, you may discover that the aircraft uh, doesn't handle particularly well uh, and you're having to pitch up higher and increasing P factor as you pitch up and another of other considerations. So normally we'd land a little bit faster than that. If you have the cockpit chart modification uh, available and uh, you'll have seen it, you'll see it in my cockpit and you will also uh, I've seen it in some of my videos before, and I'll leave a link in the description for this video. That's a really handy way of calculating what your landing speed should be at a quick glance in the cockpit. And you will see from those uh, uh, from that chart that the landing speeds that they recommend are typically higher than what's being suggested here. Just before we hop in the cockpit, uh, we'll quickly mention something else you should include in your approach planning and briefing, and that is to have a look at an airport diagram. Uh, these are freely available uh, for most countries. You can get them online through the Aeronautical Information Publication. And in the US, it's dead easy because you can get them directly from Skyvector, as well as plenty of other sources. There are, of course, uh, other sources like a Jepson chart so you can get from a Navigraph, uh, but that's paid and uh, these are free. Uh, so what you want to do is uh, check some of the essential information. Uh, there's a lot of information on here, uh, but we'll just focus on some of the core things. So that's the layout. We have our two runways, uh, two zero right and two left, which is the big one, and to your left to right, which is the short one, uh, which we should be landing at today and using for our landings, as it's the typical GA landing strip at uh, John Wayne. And that, so uh, we can see 2,886 uh, feet long, which uh, given for the weight and the altitude and weather conditions is plenty of runway for the Kodiak. Uh, other useful information, we can see here that the elevation of the runway threshold is 40 feet and that the runway is on a heading of 196. And you can use that to work out what your pattern uh, angles or pattern courses are going to be. So 196 is obviously uh, what final will be. And then 106 will be crosswind, 016 uh, will be downwind, and 286 would be uh, base. And it's useful to make a note of those beforehand. Also study the chart for anything like these red circles or hotspots or you're likely to, that's where runway incursions are most likely to occur or some other problem. 
Uh, but also you can think about when you land, where you're likely going to be taxiing to. You might be taxiing to an FBO. There's plenty of FBOs here at John Wayne, uh, quite a lot of general aviation parking. But if you have that plan in mind, uh, when you do land, you can know what way to exit uh, from the runway uh, and then what your likely taxi instructions are going to be. And it'll just make that whole post-landing process a little bit less uh, stressful, take the workload down a bit. Uh, but that's enough for the planning. Now let's hop in the cockpit, uh, do the descent and approach on our first landing. So here we are on the descent down into John Wayne. Um, I'll pick it up again closer to the airport, but I'll just say a couple of things were a bit further out. Uh, specific considerations for the Kodiak. Uh, first of all, you're nearly always going to be making a power on landing. Uh, there is very significant drag from the prop uh, and also the flaps when you're, uh, when you're coming into land, so you never glide, and if you attempt to glide it in, like uh, it's too likely crash. Um, so it's always a power on landing. If for any reason you can't, uh, it's a power off landing. If you've had an engine failure, it's almost certainly going to be a flapless landing. And as I've already mentioned, the Kodiak can be landed in any flap configuration for a normal landing. It is recommended that we use full flaps. Uh, that's flaps 35. For landings, as this will allow lower landing speeds and shorter stop distances. The second consideration with the Kodiak, specific to the Kodiak landings, is it's extremely pitch power sensitive as well. Um, as you pull back, and that's related to the drag point uh, that we just made, but as you just power, you will see the nose uh, pitch up and pitch down pretty rapidly. Uh, so that demands really fine control of the power as you come in on your uh, final approach and you absolutely want to be uh, landing with one hand on the control stick or the yoke uh, and your other hand on the throttle control or the hammer you use for that. Um, unfortunately you really can't land with the other hands on the yoke. The third thing that is very noticeable in the Kodiak is the loss of control authority as you start to get to slow speeds. Uh, it's probably better modelled than any other aircraft I've tried in this one yet. Uh, it becomes really distinctly noticeable that the controls, the aileron controls, the rudder controls start to get pretty spongy uh, once the speed drops much below 65 knots. Uh, so depending on the aircraft is and its attitude and things like that, but uh, that's a real warning sign. Once you start to feel the aircraft becoming unresponsive, you need to be hyper alert uh, about what you're doing, about your speed, and uh, you can bleed off speed very quickly and very easy to find yourself uh, in a pitched up in a nose high attitude at low speeds, close to the ground, and an irrecoverable stall um, can develop and it's very much like uh, what happens if you try and take off with the aircraft poorly configured, you will immediately enter into a steep left hand uh, roll due to P factor, torque and things like that, and crash into the ground. So you need to be very vigilant uh, to how the controls are responding. Another thing about the Kodiak is it is uh, a glass-only aircraft, there's no uh, never made with analog or steam gauges, uh, it is the G1000, uh, and that is an excellent instrument, but there is one feature of the G1000 I personally like, and that is how vertical speed is indicated. Uh, so your VSI indicator is on the right of the altitude tape, uh, and well, I find it hard to read, particularly in uh, the landing situation where your concentration has to be focused on what's going on outside. You don't have a lot of time to be looking down at your instruments on a visual landing like this. Um, 
and that's uh, you know it's just it's just uh, I think uh, and it's, you know it's no criticism of how uh, the G1000 model in the sim because it's exactly like this in real life. I just uh, wonder why Garmin chose to do it in this way. Perhaps it's easier in a real aircraft and it's more obvious, but uh, I find it a bit small part to read. So just checking, uh, that's says 15 miles out, uh, we're coming down nicely on our E path, we set a target altitude of 1500 feet, uh, which is what we want to cross uh, John Wayne at, uh, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to set up the OBS mode, uh, so we will sink the heading bug. Uh, we will go into heading mode, and we will just confirm that we are in heading mode, excellent, and we will set OBS, and the runway heading is 196, so we will set 196, let's go the wrong way, and there we have OBS 196 runway 20 left, and 2 miles to go, on the AFD, there's the magenta site there, we're just going to use that to help uh, us fly the path name tree. Now one thing we noticed, because we went into uh, that mode, uh, we lost our V-path, so uh, we're now rapidly staying too high, so we'll go VS, and we will set down all 7 From that BS down 700 feet a minute, 1500 feet targeted. In fact, I'm going to take it up to 1000 because I want to be at 1500 feet before I reach the centre of the field. And if I left it at 700 feet a minute, there's a risk that uh, I would do that. Keeping an eye on the speed, uh, a bit of torque has crept up, it was at 1250. I'll pull it back. And we also, things will happen pretty quickly once we uh, cross the uh, runway and you want to really start thinking about configuring the aircraft quite early on. Uh, it's not a Cessna, uh, you can't be having around with the flaps uh, while you're in the uh, traffic pattern, uh, you'll do it too quickly, uh, things will get ahead of you. So you want to be ahead of the aircraft, uh, you want to start slowing down in good time. Uh, and I'm going to start thinking about slowing down now. It's also worth saying that uh, as part of being ahead of the aircraft you want to do your before landing checklist uh, well in advance. I mean we've already done our uh, descent checklist in the last tutorial. Uh, but the before landing checklist we can start to think about things now. We can see the fuel now. So our fuel selectors left and right are on. Our firewall fuel is pushed. Engine inlet can remain in normal, uh, and that is indicated in the AFD. Uh, the auxiliary fuel pump uh, can now go back on. Personally, it drives me mad, but that's what the checklist calls for. And the condition lever confirmed is in the high idle. Uh, the prop lever can now go forward to max RPM, it'll do the pitch change. Wing flaps uh, we'll deal with uh, as we slow down, and the magic speeds for wind flaps are 138 knots for the first notch, 128 for flaps 20, and 108 for flaps 35. Confirm our landing lights are on, which they should be, they all are on, yeah. And at this point, our yaw damper can. I always struggle to find it. On. There we go. Your damper's off and indicated. And there's a centre of fuel coming up. And we're going to come off autopilot very shortly. And that's autopilot disengaged. So there's 132 knots on the my first bunch of flaps. R15. If you remember, we're looking for that runway 20. There's 190 knots of those flaps too. Flaps 20, I should say. I would just 
when I come across here at 100 knots or so, then we'll slow down to 90. Now, in America, the US, you enter a pattern like this at uh, 1500 feet or pattern altitude plus 500, which is, uh, as we already know, the field is only at 40 feet threshold, is, so we'll just maintain 1500. There's two zero right. mentioned in the last uh, tutorial, uh, we want to be crossing over and then we'll make a right hand turn, a uh, descending right hand turn to come in onto downwind. And you can see that uh, we've got about 900 set on the throttle. Once we go to flaps 35, you can be wanting to use anything between 950 and 1000. And the recommended distance is two nautical miles from the runway, and this is where the OBS comes in helpful. We've got our cross track error there. We're certainly going to turn to the right before we get too close to this terrain. Just watching your speed, you've got to watch all the time in the Kubiak, it creeps down. So is really important. If you're flying into a field that you know. So we're 108 knots, bring that down. I'm going to be flying the downwind at about 90. Uh, we've got a uh, V ref of 56 knots at this weight. So we can get slower than that. And the downwind is 016, so we're a little bit off that. Watching the speed. And again, having good uh, landmarks is always useful. I know that that is the boat hanger. Adding a bit more power again. I don't want to go full flaps before turning to base. Just a little low. Bring in full flaps now. I know that cluster of buildings off to the left there. And that is also a really good aiming point for a turn to base, but because I want to give myself a little bit more time, I'm going to extend it. Um, the base as we come again. So speed is good, altitude is good. We're a little bit off course. And we're going to be turning to our base, which is uh, 286. So we'll start our turn now. Crept up a little bit. Very thin controls. There's 286, just to push a little, and again, watching the speed to see I'm down to triple 70 knots. Now, 
flaps are set. Landing lights are on, fuse lights are on. Yeah, we're open to. And we'll just start our starting our descent now and again. Coming back with the power. Fine adjustments on the power. The other trick with the G1000 is to use to return to our final. there and uh, we'll take uh, another approach we'll try and uh, do another approach and break it all down again uh, talk about it through some of those aspects in a bit more detail so there was quite a lot going on on the uh, first approach and landing and uh, we'll have another go same runway to your left We've completed our before landing checklist our flaps are set lights are set fuel selectors Condition levers and idle. The only thing I haven't done is put the uh, auxiliary fuel pump on. Just put that on standby. And this time we were on a three mile final. Looks like we want to run in. We can see that we can be in a BS mode, we're lined up. I can see the pappies saying I'm a bit high, so let's start the descent down from that altitude. Using that green flight path thing to 
want to position that at uh, ideally at about three degrees. Showing a little high, happy. Just watch the speed. We'll reduce the torque a little bit. You can see I just brought it down to 900 there. You see the speed starts to decline fairly rapidly. Give me a bigger sync rate. We'll bring the torque back up now. Landing speed 62 knots. That's what we want to cross the threshold at, so we're at 72. So we can afford to uh, a little higher, still high on profile. These are well modelled pappies on this scenery. Correctly positioned. And one red, three white. There we go, two red, two white. Oh, we're trying to keep the aim point in same location, which out speed 66 knots, 64, don't want it to get any slower than that, so just gently adding a little bit of torque. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to maintain the center line in Microsoft Flight Simulator, just the way the ground physics are modelled. There appear to be a few odd bumps on this runway as well. So let's have a look at what happens if you do the same sort of approach, except you're too low and slow. Okay, so here's another approach. Uh, this time we're quite low, already at 500 feet, and the aircraft's a lot heavier as well. We're at 6,880 pounds, the 18 ventilated before, and that is because uh, the problem I want to demonstrate here is always much worse when the aircraft is heavier. And I'm going to deliberately bleed off the power a little bit. 70. I'm already having to pull back pretty hard on the yoke, and there's the speed dropping. Okay, and now I can feel the it's getting spongy in the controls. The ailerons aren't responding. I'm having to pull back higher and higher, stall. and there we are getting close to a stall. So I'll put the nose down. Stall. Stall. It's very difficult. And see the yaw that starts to form to the left? That is the yaw of death. You see that yaw starting to develop in this attitude. We were only 200 feet off the ground. I mean, I'm adding power. The key here is if you do find yourself in this scenario to recover it, you must add power gently and keep the nose low and let the speed recover. And then we were, in fact, we were there and we did actually recover from that. We did not turn in to the yaw of death but I'll do it again without a recovery this time so pulling back the power pulling up on the yoke you can see from the runway shape far too low for red 67 oh can I make it can I make it and then Pulling back more and more, more and more. Stop! Oh. Stop! Well, I hit trees anyway. <laughs> so, you know, that is why you cannot let uh, the power bleed off too much. And if uh, you do start to feel that sponginess immediately, you need to add power and drop the nose and keep the nose down because as you add power, the nose will want to go up. That's not going to help you. You've got to really apply some forward pressure on your stick uh, and let the speed build and only once the speed has built back up 
to something like 75 or above can you consider really starting to pull back and do not consider bringing the flaps up uh, either uh, until you are uh, got quite a bit of speed higher. Um, and that starts to get us into the realm of a uh, go around or a bolt landing and we can look at that next. So let's uh, consider we're again in this low and slow situation, just 54 knots. You can see how much we're pitched up or our angle of attack is. And we're going to reject this landing. Do a go around. So, going to add takeoff power. The nose is going to want to pitch up, but you've got to let it drop. That's takeoff power set. I'm going to bring the nose down. Okay, now we can climb out. We can bring flaps up. And that's not so difficult to recover from as long as you get it early and you make sure you don't let the nose pitch up too much. So a good stable approach is the key to a good landing. And this is where trim can really help and help stop some of the poor poisoning up and down or that bouncing up and down that you might get. So we're at 73 knots now, 300 feet per minute, it's all good, but I don't want to get any slower. Three white, one red, so we'll pick up a little speed by increasing our sync rate. Still a little high. Now it's worth mentioning that uh, many of the pappies in Microsoft Flight Simulator are incorrectly placed and they'll uh, cause you to land long. These ones in this scenery are correctly placed and if you follow them you should uh, cross the threshold at 50 feet. And 73 knots, 400 feet per minute, that's all good. And this time, with the flare, round out time, I'm going to really try and keep the nose off. So it still landed a bit flat uh, the first time, and also the second time I came in. So, and there is 50 feet crossing the threshold, pulling the power back, getting the round out really good. But if you don't pull the power all the way back, you balloon. Yeah. It's very tricky to get the coordination for that just right. And as always, you seem to want to go to the left. <laughs> so that'll be our final landing uh, for today. I'll just uh, take it off the taxi uh, off to the left here at the end of this runway and after landing clean the aircraft up so it flaps up forgive me if my taxiing is a bit jerky I've got new rudder pedals and I'm still getting used to them so flaps are up and then our landing lights and strobes can go off and we're clear of the runway so the condition lever can go to idle but I'll cover the proper shutdown procedures in the next tutorial thank you very much for watching I uh, hope you found it useful any questions uh, please uh, don't hesitate to leave a comment and uh, look forward to seeing you in the next video thanks for now